Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome today. I'm Shreya Sundaram. I'm the Murray Gordon Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Purdue. I'm also the co-director of our Institute for Control Optimization and Networks, or ICON. Uh, so here, we're here today to hear from one of the greats in uh, control theory, Professor Tommy Zuka from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, in fact, you know, Purdue has a long history of contributions to automatic control going all the way back to at least Rufus Oldenberger in the 1950s when he started the uh, Automatic Control Center here at Purdue with significant contributions to the space race. Uh, in fact, one of the main awards in control theory is named after Rufus Oldenberger, and it's no surprise that Dr. Tommy Zuka is one of the recipients of that award back in 2002. Um, that control center uh, went away after a while, but of course the amount of activity in control theory and autonomous systems spanning both classical approaches and emerging techniques in AI and, and model uh, data-driven approaches continues here. So it was with that legacy and that foundation that we decided to start this institute about three years ago, really to bring together all of the faculty from across the College of Engineering and Purdue uh, to join forces to be able to tackle some of these grand challenges in autonomous systems. Uh, so ICON has three pillars of research, education, and engagement with uh, government and industry. Uh, one of our most stimulating activities is our seminar series where we get to hear from top experts in the field and today, you know, is really one of the most influential people in controls. And so it was a prime opportunity to join forces with the College of Engineering to leverage the Engineering Frontiers lecture series to showcase somebody of this stature. Uh, so with that backdrop, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Dean Arvin Robin uh, to come and say a few words about Dr. Tommy Zuka. Arvin. Thank you, thank you, Shreyas. Um, what, a, what a great afternoon, what a great evening to launch our Engineering uh, Frontier series here this fall. And I'm really proud today, and what a great honor to introduce uh, our speaker for the day, uh, Professor Masayoshi Tomisuka from UC Berkeley. He is the Cheryl and John uh, Neerhout Distinguished Professor of Mechanical Engineering at UC Berkeley. He is, of course, a world-renowned expert in control theory, uh, and not just control theory, but control theory, when you look at combining model-based uh, control approaches with new machine learning approaches, mechatronics, and the impact of his work has been felt in so many domains, whether it's robotics, whether it's autonomous vehicles, or whether it's amongst the dozens of his PhD students and postdocs who have gone on to become experts, world-renowned experts on their own, two of whom are sitting in the audience here today as well. It's a tremendous impact, and he's been recognized for that impact in so many ways. Uh, you know, it begins with the Charles Russ Richards Memorial Award uh, at the ASME, the Rufus Oldenburger um, Award medal uh, out of ASME as well that Shreyas referred to. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, as a part of that history connection, Rufus Oldenburger and, and Purdue, he came uh, that year to do a talk and a lecture here at Purdue, that's the tradition that usually happens, uh, that the medal recipient at ASME comes here and gives that talk as well. Uh, he went on to receive the Richard Bellman Control Heritage Award, um, and then later the Nichols Medal from IFAC. IFAC, incidentally, was also an organization that was established by Rufus Oldenberger as well. And then he's a lifetime fellow of the IEEE, and last year was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Professor Tomizuka. So good afternoon. Thank you very much for a very nice introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful seminar series. I'm glad to see so many young people here. I'm on the other side of the extreme. I, people always ask me, when do you retire? When do you retire? So I, I keep saying, give me a little more time before retirement. Okay. So I'm still doing, I'm going, and gave me, I think the Zilang, my friend, gave me a good title for this talk. I said that's 50 years a year at Berkeley, he said, no, no, not exciting. So came from state space control to intelligent machines, a five decade journey in control of mechanical systems. So that's what I'm talking today. 
もう2つのこれがうんじゃあ、I think it's OK Okay, so this slide summarizes my half century at the University of California, Berkeley. And I think not just my history, but I think somehow my Berkeley professional career development nicely go with naturally I jump into this field. Okay, so I came to the US because the US was leading the control theory development. In the 1960s, space exploration. So, maximum principle, dynamic programming, all kinds of things appeared around that time, Kalman filtering. So, I came. And then the, I was introduced to the modern technology at that time, modern. I think I could use computer, or I think computer, IBM 1130 Pro, you don't know what it is, but I could see the PID control loop make a nice quarter damping response. When I saw the response, I really feel, felt that control theory came closer to me. And then the 1970s was a time when the, the computation Capability really started going up. At the beginning, control theory was so space exploration for big chemical plant, and it was not for vehicle, tabletop manipulator, and so forth. But the, the, the DSP, large scale integration technology, they make it change. The, it can be used for any small systems. So I noticed I just grew up that kind of technology. And also around that time, mechanical systems, there were lots of interesting development. The robotics was really becoming, robot becoming very popular, and computer hard disk drive. And also the, the, wind, the hard disk drive, and also the, the automated vehicle, vehicle control area the control is more and more needed. So that was very natural for me to think about the control of mechanical systems based and implement the modern technology to really see what is the advantage. And that's how my laboratory started. So at the beginning, I was doing some microprocessor based chemical process control and so forth. Then adaptive welding process control, the robot control, that kind of thing was added and automated driving came in. And then my group became GRU. I always put control methodology in the sensor because uh, the, my home ground is always control. And, but then this technology is surrounded by all kinds of mechanical systems. And often the problem that we challenged was motivated by solving some of the, the target area problems, like machining. From machining, we developed some the adaptive control methodology. And so we found, oh, that methodology can be used, robot, and so forth. In that way, there was some very interesting interaction between application and the theory development. So now this is my sort of activities. I use the same photo that I was sent here. And presently, that still I'm doing mechanical systems control, but two major target area, target topic, is intelligent robot and autonomous vehicles. Those are the two currently very interesting, challenging area to apply methodology control. But it's not only control, all kinds of things, AI, machine learning, image processing, those things are all coming in. And in fact, I, I realized that what I'm doing is so-called mechatronics. Okay, I gave some, some talks in recent years about mechatronics. Mechatronics is the integration of decision-making control theory and electronics 
information technology like computer and then to apply them to the mechanical systems. And this area is really evolving, growing and growing. 1970 happens to be the time when I was a student and I was starting my career. But then it's new methodology, new device technology was introduced as time goes on. So at the beginning, I used PDP-8 computer, PDP-7 computer pro, which doesn't mean much to you, young people, but I started with those so-called mini computers. Okay. And then LSI integration DSP. And if I just add, keep this trend, more recent things, in 2020 now, we have AI machine learning methodology coming and IoT, GPU, and so forth. And there are lots of interesting target problem. Now, from methodology point of view, when the new method comes in, I don't, even, I don't think that the new methodology is replacing the old one. I think, to me, I have a big toolbox full of daily methodologies. And instead of big hammer-like approach, just to use one methodology to solve everything, I look for what will be the best way to combine, take advantage of any methodology in my box. Sometimes that approach could be a combination of several things. So currently, for example, I encourage my students to look into how model-based control and machine learning can be blended, integrated, to solve some exciting new problems. So from now on, I, I would like to introduce some decent research at Mechanical Systems Control Lab. Okay, two pillars. One is intelligent industrial robot. I will introduce several projects. And autonomous driving, I will introduce several projects. There may be too many topics, so I don't want to go into deep in each topic, but I would like to give you some flavor of what kind of things are going on. If somebody asks me too much details, probably I cannot even answer, right? So, so let me start with some robot control. Okay, so this one, safe and efficient robot collaboration systems for next generation intelligent industrial core robot. This was an NSA project that lasted for a very long time, and we ended in 2022. And here, what we looked into is the, how we can really bring the robot out of cage and let robot collaborate with human in a very productive way. So human-robot collaboration was a big topic, and when that happens, we have to ensure safety. And so safety was a big issue, so I'll talk about that aspect. And other topic will be come after this. Oops, I think I'm pushing the wrong button. Sorry about that. Human-robot collaboration, okay. So motivation was some the flexible automation and co-robot type of idea. So because of that, we decided to look into how human and robot can help each other. And that happens in the factory automation and even the automated vehicle. Currently, autonomous cars and manually driven cars share the same infrastructure. So the question is how those two may collaborate well. So in that sense, the problem is very similar. And in this project, NSA project, what we came up with something like safe and efficient robot collaboration systems, CEROX. So CEROX idea, it has got several modules. I think with the, the robot systems, it has environmental monitoring module. Essentially, this one look into the environment, especially as a human collaborator, what he wants to do, what he is doing to ensure that robot and human do not encounter each other, collide, and so forth. Then 
when both of them are there, what will be the most reasonable, best way to let human and robot collaborate? So making task plan is another big task, and getting good task plan and what's going on in the environment, in real time, we have to decide safe and efficient motion planning and control. Okay, so that was the third module. And first module and third module has strong control content, so I would like to emphasize on the first module and third module. And this is human monitoring, environment monitoring, especially human. Looking at the scene, what model, what we are, it's doing is based on motion, we observe the past K number, number of data. Then based on that, we will predict how human will be moving. So motion prediction, future motion prediction based on past observation. And we made some neural network approach for this motion prediction. And by introducing one the layer the, to be adaptive, we introduced standard adaptive control methodology there. And we noted that the network becomes quite flexible and versatile to work for many type of humans. So network, network, the neural network itself can be developed by offline, but we left some online aspect, adaptive feature. So it's the same software, same neural network work for the different environment, the different, different person. Okay, then task three is a real time motion planning and optimal, the, the safe motion planning and control. And for this part, essentially, it's nothing but optimization game. So we formulated the problem as an optimization. In the middle, there is a robot dynamics and also human dynamics at the bottom. So how they will be, the robot should be controlled based on what human is doing, observing human. So this is a typical block diagram. And we minimize the robot cost function subject to a number of constraint, dynamic constraint, and maybe the, the input constraint and so forth. But most important constraint is to ensure safety. X belonging to that capital XS means that robot and human are in the safe region. Okay, so as long as this is ensured, safety is assured. Now, this safety problem is a very tricky problem to analyze in advance. So if we remove this requirement, safety constraint, the other part is becomes a standard optimal control problem. So by standard optimization approach, we can find some good solution. And that's what essentially Chan Liu's dissertation was. So she devised the so-called convex feasible set algorithm. It's nothing but optimization algorithms, minimize JX, start from some initial trajectory. X, in this case, the whole trajectory. And then the, to something searching to make the J function go smaller in a convex feasible set. Because whole region, if you try to do optimization once, it's non-convex, so it's not feasible. So make the convex region and do some feasible set the optimization there. And then you come to some next xk plus one, and we make sure whether we made some, some sub substantial move or a very, only very small move from the previous optimal path. And if the change is minimal, we say, okay, convergence has taken place, and we say that, okay, we can find, we found a optimal path. Idea is conceptually starting from one 
set minimized, then the new convex set is defined and finally reach to the minimum. Okay, this is a blue curve, blue, blue line indicates the contour of the constant, the J value. If it starts with somewhere which does not belong to the one convex feasible set, we can shift this initial point inside of this convex set and then move and end up at the same place. Okay, so this is an uh, iterative algorithm and turns out to be very efficient and implementable and we could find some good path which can not, does not make any collision with at least stationary obstacles. Gray thing indicates stationary obstacles. But when dynamic obstacles there, say robot, for robot, human is a dynamic obstacle. Human may be walking around. So that to make it safe with the human presence, so we have to do some more real-time computation. And for doing that, so she came up, Shan Liu came up with the safe set algorithms. So we have one axis robot, the other axis for human. And as long as we are in blue region, it's safe. So we are operating at some region. But if it's predicted that the human will move down, if we robot, robot stays at the same place or same trajectory, collision will take place. So in that case, it's better to robot also step back so two can stay in the blue region. And for this, so she defined so-called safety index. As long as safety index is negative, P equals zero is the level set. If P is negative, it's safe. Okay, so if P tends to go large, phi is positive, we would like to make sure that phi dot is less than zero. So always bring back to the safe region. Okay, so this turns out to be a very efficient algorithm also to ensure safety. So the structure became that we have a convex feasible set algorithm to decide some global motion, avoiding static the obstacle. Then introducing this human robot to stay in the safe region, we use the safety controller. Okay. And safety controller normally runs at a very fast rate to ensure safety. So the graphical explanation is if this UR, the robot control, stays outside of the safe set of control, essentially this UR should be put back, pushed back to the safe or safety region and actually the closest from actually optimum UR. So that was really the idea. And putting everything together to show this the validity of the approach, we did some demo so in this demo, there are two robots involved. One is mobile robot, actually several, two human workers involved. And they are collaborating, one worker with robot, and another worker, robot is assisting another worker. Camera is used to record what's going on, but not for control. This is just for recording purpose. So in the left, human and robot doing some assembly, computer assembly and robots too is helping human worker to carry the, to move, give some item to another worker. Okay, so this is the sort of the ending of this project, NSF project. Now, another project I would like to introduce is safe online gain optimization for Cartesian space control. This is essentially impedance control Impedance control is really used for the, the robot interacting with environment. Question is how do we get it adjust impedance? 
and if we have time varying environment, how we may actually change program impedance. So there are lots of work already done, adaptive control, reinforced, reinforcement learning, optimization, and so forth. So I think each has got some limitation, so we try to go beyond that limitation. And what we have proposed is essentially impedance gain is taken as a sort of manipulate signal, control input that we can adjust. And for doing that, we have to have a dynamic equation with impedance gain as a control input. Then, based on that equation, we do some online tuning. And on top of that, we wanted to also address safety, optimal impedance gain in real time, but establish safety. If the robot go outside the safety region, we would like to embed some impedance. It's very resisting to go beyond that boundary. So we would like to accomplish both the the impedance gain optimization and impedance gain adjustment for safety, and we wanted to do the same two things. And for first optimization part, equation was written in terms of U as, U is uh, at the bottom, as you see here, all kinds of impedance gain, starting from the robot impedance, Cartesian space impedance control equation, we massaged this equation into the bottom. So U is uh, input impedance gain, and we make adjustment. And once we write this equation in this form, essentially we optimize U such that certain objective is achieved. Objective we, is achieved is really the time integral minimized. But instead of error itself, we said E dot, velocity multiplied by time. This is a good thing to optimize. So optimize this quantity. Actually, so, so we keep doing optimization every certain second. We can make the transition to move, in this case, baby example problem, mass is contacting the, some compliant surface. If we do some light optimization, we get response which is shown by the blue line in the plot. If we just do the manual tuning, the best performance is green. And if, that, if we are very naive, the red line is just bouncing around. So we can have ensure some good performance by this optimization. And for the ensure safety, essentially it's a collision avoidance constraint. Robots stay inside region. Essentially we have constraint HX should be greater than zero. And if we can find U, that this condition is always satisfied, problem is done, but Normally, H equation does not include U, so we don't have how, we know how we should select U to make sure HX is greater than zero. Then there is some very convenient methodology called control barrier function, so we utilize that approach. Essentially, look into the derivative of H and multiplication of alpha H. If that's greater than zero, that's sufficient for H to be zero if H is starting from positive. So all we need is to take derivative of H. If this derivative of H thing does not produce U, we can keep going to higher order derivative. And finally, in this example, after second derivative, we find U, so we can find condition to make sure H is always positive. So this is a one example, plastic board contact. Hmm, 
with okay, the Nizu started. This is adaptive variable impedance control. It's, this is already doing a fairly good job. And then there is another movie which should be running. Hmm? Okay, this is constant gain base, baseline. If gain is fixed, constant, bouncing always takes place, so it's not good. Oops. The last one is uh, proposed method. Proposed method works very nice. I think I just I ask you to believe that there is some nice <laughs> movie there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oops. Okay. I think some movie is hard. Okay. Then, then collision avoidance constraint. Without collision avoidance constraint, constant baseline, robot is easily pushed outside of this square area. But if we have collision avoidance constraint, safe on go weak, as coming to edge, impedance becomes so high, so robot resists the all kinds of motion. Now, this is efficient sim to real transfer. For, this is for also contact-rich manipulation. Contact-rich manipulation is very popular. So if we try to do this kind of manipulation, robot need to physically engage with the environment and manipulate object by applying suitable control force. Traditionally, the robot programmer essentially adjusts the impedance gain and so forth to do this kind of thing. But we can do this by some learning-based approach. So this is what show, we are showing is how, what we can do by learning-based approach. And actually, the framework has got two parts. We do by offline, offline learning. Then in online phase, the we just introduce the sensor feedback. The force is measured by sensor, and based on sensor output, we further adjust admittance control gain, essentially impedance control gain. If we do this type of adjustment, it turns out that it's a very nice and robust approach. We have comparing direct deployment Without the, the online part, it's not doing well. Manual tuning is, works for some particular setting, but it's not transferable. But proposed method works nice and also works in other type of environment also. So we did some interesting way of learning the for how the gain should be adjusted by learning. Okay. And to show that some versatility, we uh, tried to apply this method for the screwing problem. Essentially, find the right place so this twisting action is something else, but we can successfully do the screwing type operation. Another one is contact aware model based learning from visual demonstration for robot manipulation via differentiable physics based simulation and rendering. This is fairly also decent work. And there are lots of YouTube video human doing all kinds of nice skills. Then we ask question, how I can imitate this? And more specifically, three questions is, what is the movement of the object? We have to analyze the movement of the object. And then after that, I have, we have to figure out how should I make contact to the object? And once we figure out that, 
whether we can really to implement the idea in real time. Okay, so essentially seeing how did this part. Okay, the first part, what is the movement of the object? It's nothing but the image processing, rendering game. So he utilized the right methodology for doing that. And how should a robot contact the object? He came up with hierarchical structure in the lower part. Essentially, robot has got a figure out two things, how it makes a contact with the object and how to move. So those are the two basic skills. And at higher level, the, the robot contract or skill controller will figure out how those two should be, be coordinated. And actually, that will make the real nice the imitate the motion. But to implement that one in real time, the second block, how should a robot contact the object, Figuring out the approach is too heavy for the real-time implementation. So for final implementation, he used the neural network in imitation learning based on the thing he learned from the second block, and he implemented. And perception module, task figuring out module, final implementation. So it did pretty good. Now the last one, robotics things I would like to introduce is very, very recent distributed multi-agent interaction generation with imagined potential games. So this one we just submitted to the next year American Control Conference. I think major contribution comes from the first two authors, Ling Feng, PhD student, and Pin Yun Huang, she's just finished master's uh, work, but she's very skillful implementer of some idea. So they work together to do this kind of thing. Essentially, distributed multi-agent interaction takes place in problems involving mobile robot and autonomous vehicles. So it's common to robot and vehicles and unless we do good coordination, we end up with either so-called deadlock or collision. But if human, red and blue are both human, they normally figure out how to handle the situation without really even communication, without speaking. They naturally find some good way to avoid that. So the research goal was set generate human-like interaction behavior in cooperation, require scenario for non-communication multi-agent simulation. So he, they did lots of simulation. And proposed method is essentially based on game theory. So agent assumes a cooperation exists and predict plan based on the imagined cooperation. So essentially the each agent solve some equation, game equation, to, to minimize certain common objective, but without no communication. And normally, when two agent, or even multi-agent, are doing their best, and each reach to a point that further change does not make sense. And so that's something called Nash equilibrium. So, Idea here is an agent imagines a cooperation game existed between other agent and itself. So formulates a potential game as an optimization problem. And goal of the game is of course no collision, no crash, but each agent can reach to the goal point. Okay, so avoid conflict. So the agent use essentially the current state, each agent use current state. So assume that uh, the other have essentially the same safety policy distance. And based on that, the one agent the, makes some optimum decision. And the other agent essentially makes the optimum decision. But his parameter may be different from another guy. So that, that's why some they can decide, end up to nice cooperation. Each agent assumes that current state 
position heading angle velocity and target position that known, but have to estimate other, okay, so other things. And essentially, this looks like a game. Equation involved is uh, minimum of this performance index, P, S. That has to be minimized over the problem duration. And dynamic constraint is a discrete time dynamic constraint. X, U has some constraint. And also some distance, safety consideration. That kind of constraint exists. And in solving this, it looks like a more model predictive control approach. We gather measurement, correct environmental information, and each agent tries what will be the best trajectory, what is the best control input. And it turns out that the, the, the iterative LQR is the right methodology to, to solve this problem. And finding this, like use the first step of the optimal control input and go back to the first step correct and so forth. Challenge here is when you solve in the second step this ILQR, you have to make sure that its use can be solved in real time. So ILQR is now well documented and Essentially, ILQR is iterative solving linear quadratic problem, very classic problem. Linear system, quadratic cost function. But in this game, what we have is not necessarily quadratic. Dynamics is not linear. So you need to do some approximation and iteratively approach to the optimal solution. Okay, so that, that's the kind of thing we have to do. Okay, so this is dynamic equation. Even unicycle dynamic model for each agent becomes nonlinear. Okay. And then dissolve de deadlock. Oops. And uh, distributed and no communication. So each solving and then nicely avoid collision and each get to their goal. And this method was compared with some other method and success rate of the proposed method is 100%. I, I, there is a case that I can, imagine, I can imagine that this will still not solve, but as, as far as Simulation is concerned. The two students told me that it's 100%. No deadlock, no collision. And some interesting case. Okay, so realistic and various behaviors. And actually, the, the, we can handle more than two agents. So without collision, each is moving to the place where they wanted without collision. And this is another multi-many agent case. So I, I, I like the work because it was fairly clear what they are just trying to achieve and quite visible the effect of what they have done and high success rate. And IPG can generate diverse and realistic behavior. And I think this con work continues, but it's an interesting thing. Now, I think at the remaining 10 minutes or something, I would like to introduce autonomous driving research Summary, okay, so we have done vehicle control for many years. In 
There was a program called California Pass, Partners for Advanced Transit and Highway. And in the context of automating the highway operation, I was involved in vehicle lateral control. So in that case, this is a very standard diagram. We have sensor, state estimation, controller, plant, and we embedded magnet in the middle of the lane, and steering was done to follow the magnet. Then more recent autonomous driving, more than that, motion planning, decision making, perception, prediction, and sensing state estimation is more general direction tracking and localization, and map data may be utilized. So it becomes a really interesting integration of many aspects from perception, prediction, planning, control, and HD map data pipeline simulation and test. So the, my group has been looking into all aspects. Some aspect has got more strong control component. Some, as, some aspect doesn't really show much control in more image processing. But we uh, generated some hardware to do experiment. And if here, I would like to emphasize how we may have utilized both model-based control and machine learning take advantage. Model-based control, we have good mathematical foundation and lots of things is known. But machine learning, essentially based on experience as a human expert, okay, we do imitation learning and so forth. Instead of just defend, finding it out from model, we can do all kinds of learning approach, the reinforcement learning, model machine learning. We can learn the, the strategy directly. So question is how we may combine those two for the best. And we have shown some successful case of combining two. And one is zero-shot deep reinforcement learning driving policy transfer for autonomous vehicles based on robust control. And essentially, uh, this is a typical up, up agent environment, typical reinforcement learning loop. And we done this kind of policy for some the, the learning scenario. Okay, so, training scenario, but when you actually apply the policy to the test scenario, there may be some extra factor which was not properly taken into consideration, disturbance, vehicle is different dynamics change and so forth. So how do we make it more robust to the disturbance, to the dynamics change? And we, as a human, if you run the driving of Mercedes, you can drive almost any cars, right? Even you can drive even big truck with little running. So human can do, do this kind of adjustment quite easily. So essentially, we say that, okay, controller should be able to do this adjustment. We have zero shot robustness, interpretability, all possible. And one way we looked is when we do machine learning, what we learn should be something really more generic, invariant to the detail of the vehicle dynamics. So from environment, if we learn some policy, the how do we make, define a waypoint future trajectory, as we should be following this trajectory. Once we are learning that kind of things, that trajectory probably can be utilized wide set of vehicles, so it can be applied. Dynamics change may exist, the wind may be blowing, but that's the kind of thing that existing control theory can do a good job. Robust control theory, even disturbance observer, all kinds of things can be introduced there. So we used robust reinforce, reinforcement learning is baseline, 
and we are the robust controller. So on the top baseline, robust reinforcement learning policy and robust controller added in the middle. And if we don't add robust controller, essentially that crashes and won't work. And we checked the robustness for two things. One is for dynamic variation, parameter variation. The other one is side force coming from either wind or super elevation. And this red is when we have robust controller added to the basic non reinforcement non policy. Blue is robust controller is not added. Okay, without performance reward, it really quickly drops. Okay, this is another case that we in successfully integrated planning and control or the reinforcement learning and model-based control. Essentially, we ask what is the important one during planning? What is important in action? Okay, so this is essentially more model predictive control. We have model predictive control. Essentially, we run some for trajectory over the horizon, we run policy. But when we implement, we just apply the first step and then go to the, to the optimization again. So we structured the, what we should plan, run, run, and what we should do in real time control integrated planning and control modules. Policy layer essentially run the, the approach. If we policy layer, we have to solve this model predictive control-like thing over a long horizon. If you try to do in real time, this takes too much time. The compute the, the time, the very heavy, computation heavy, on the other hand, execution layer, if we have surrounding vehicle to avoid and so forth, model predictive, model predictive control is very fast, easy to implement. So policy layer, we just train neural network, and for the execution layer, we applied predictive, model predictive control in the other time. And this is essentially overtaking scenario, the comparing the case we have just model predictive or the without model predictive control and with predictive control. The upper plot is when model predictive control is added to the policy we learned from the neural network. Bottom, without that policy, the neural network-based policy can bring car to crash. And car following case, it's the same thing. The, if we don't use the model predictive control module added, car can come close and start following, but essentially drive into the, the previous car cause crash. Okay, so that model predictive control part is a very important part. Courteous autonomous car is an interesting topic, but probably I should, I have no time. Okay, so essentially it's a, I, how we can bring courtesy to the autonomous driving, that's a question. Okay, so that's something I have prepared for today's talk. And final slide is acknowledgement, and funding comes from various places, the agency, federal California agency, as well as private institute, and some HKCLR is Hong Kong government, and in private industry like FANAC, NSK, and so forth. And I have been benefiting to be a Berkeley faculty fantastic colleague and most 
all the work essentially I'm reporting here is done by my student. Okay, so it's, I'm surrounded by very marvelous student. I think my student I call it as much as not autonomous vehicle but autonomous student. <laughs> so, so well, what I have to do is to be I be I'm a central computer, okay, watching and trying to coordinate all the intelligent vehicles, intelligent students. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Tommy, for uh, the very great talk. Um, it was very impressive. So now we can open the floor to questions from the audience. Thank you, Professor, for such a fantastic talk. I have a question more into the like philosophical um, area. The new uh, arising of, of machine learning techniques is, you know, over coming everything and uh, very ubiquitous. So many researchers are trying to replace all the control approaches for a single uh, machine learning block, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that this is time consuming and not very realistic. I believe that a combination is in place and will be in place for, for a long time. What do you envision for, for the future of control with the machine learning techniques? Are they gonna be a, alone as a single block or a combination? Thank right. you. So I, I, th I think still the, the tr trick may, may be that how we can make best use of the machine learning combined with model learning. I don't think it comes to a point that using a, some the language <laughs> the program, okay, I have to design a controller for my robot which has got two joint give me a control. Okay, it doesn't come to that point. Still, I have to un put in my thinking intelligence. So model-based control, probably in that case. So I, th I, I think so, so it, 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 it is an exciting area. I think if we totally ignore machine learning, it's a mistake, because it's a very nice, powerful technique. But I don't think I would be replacing my, much, my nice, control methodology, for that matter, very classical, even LQ, the, the, that type of control by AI, okay? Thank you. Mm. Any more questions from the audience? Oh, one at the back. Uh, thanks for your like, presentation, which is very impressive and significant. Um, I just have a general question about the controller. So, uh, as in the industry, most of the applications are still using the PID controllers. I'm just curious about like why the research about the more advanced or fancy controller are still important, and uh, what's the significance of that? Thank you. I, th I, I think it's uh, the, the PID controller, I th Actually, it's amazingly robust and very simple. So I think for not complicated the requirement, probably people like PID controller, it has been used for many years, reliable. But I think once the project, the control becomes a little more complicated, okay, we would like to achieve we go for immediately react to this situation. That, that kind of starts thing coming. I mean, PID is not enough. If PID, at least people has to add some other module to PID. So PID plus more advanced control module, maybe one mode to go. But if we do that, you don't, I don't think there is a strong need for stick to PID. I think the PID itself can be replaced by more state feedback control or model-based control and so forth. But PID is a good controller. I, I would never throw away PID from my box. Okay. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, kind of go, circling back to talking about machine learning and control, 
uh, in your experience, or at least in your opinion, what do you think are some of the low-hanging fruits where we can kind of apply machine learning to control techniques without losing those nice first-order guarantees that we get from control? Mm -hmm. so, I, I think I don't do the, 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 the fear out the, how the machine learning methodology is figuring out, but I think there's uh, still, depending on what you decide on input to the, to the machine learning module, what should be some latent variable, what should be the output variable, that choice is still ours, right? So if, the, if we don't make that good choice there, still good thing is not coming out. Okay, I'm talking with students. Students must have gone through that kind of struggle, and they are probably reporting me the best results <laughs> they have got, so in that sense. But it's just, just like with using standard control theory. Okay, so what do you provide as input parameter to that module is, I think, extremely important, depending on that whether you get good one Good result, bad result. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So, so kind of yeah. like hyperparameter tuning, those finicky parts of control. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Probably I would take the advantage. Um, so, Dr. Tommy, you talk about all those uh, fans who are about autonomous driving and using all these machine learning algorithms, uh, but vehicles or transportation is a, such a safety critical application. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think the role of machine learning in the aspect of controlling the vehicles uh, and to guarantee the safety of all those vehicles, especially a lot of those machine learning algorithms that are not predictable, they are in you know, a black box. So mm -hmm. what's, what's your opinion yeah, on that? I think it's a very interesting question. Right? Some people argued that the autonomous driving, because uh, what the advantage is it removes human from the driving loop. Okay, if you look at the accident cause statistics, the human is a big reason that accident took place. So by, autom by automation, if human is gone, it, that itself is a big the advantage. That was one argument I had. But there, there, there are some other counter argument to that. That's not quite true, right? Because if we just look at what happened to the, even the Waymo vehicle or even the Tesla vehicle or the pilot, the accident happens and essentially that accident is still traced back to the human error. Software is never be the error free. It's quite actually it's, uh, error prone. Okay, so in, in that sense, you never removed the, the most serious element in the accident chain. And if the AI is utilized not for autonomous driving, just for the home heating and so forth, one day home heater didn't work was not such a big deal, but the autonomous driving, it's, I completely agree with you, safety is very important. So I, whether we can ever reach to a stage that the, even something happens whether there is some even AI loop to, to resolve this situation, unless that kind of guarantee comes, we, I, I probably I cannot 100% trust the, the AI. But on the other hand, because of that reason, if you say that, okay, I will never involve the, the automated vehicle, I think you are very losing very important part. Okay, so accident, I, I, I meet accident anyway, right? And I think accident rate is very low. So whether the, I just trade off my all, in, all convenience I can benefit from the AI just for that fear. So it's a, I think it comes to, down to, at the moment, the best answer becomes more philosophical. Okay, what, what do you believe, what is important for you? Right? Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I wonder, looking back on a very long and productive career, um, are there problems that you wish you would have worked on or would have worked on earlier? The, who, who, is it, what, what, what is question? Looking back, yeah. are there problems that you wish you would have worked on or worked on sooner? Hmm, maybe, maybe lots of problems, but I think my, I, actually is that uh, I lived with the, always stream. When the opportunity comes, I took always that opportunity. I, I, because it's, it's simply the, the opportunity didn't come, I didn't work on. I think if I, it would have been nice. I did something like preview control for my PhD. Some people used pre preview control, but predictive control became much more popular. Right? Predic uh, the idea looks very similar. So in that sense, if I formulate a little bit more general, like predictive control, probably more people know about me, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's simply I didn't have that kind of opportunity. So I don't have any, in that sense, I miss this opportunity and I regret. I don't have that kind of thing. I think I'm quite happily reached to my stage. And I think I have been very lucky. Thanks. Uh, so hi, Professor Tomitsuka. Thank you for your um, presentation. and. Uh, um, my question is, um, when I look in, uh, li listen to your presentation, it seems that uh, robotics is closely related with vehicle and there are lots of similarities. But apparently, there, sh there should not be a seamless integration for the control al algorithm from robotics directly to the vehicle. So my question is, uh, uh, except from the requirement of real-time execution in terms of solution space, how do you think the um, solution space in robotics differs from that in vehicle control? Thank you. I see. The, I think my, my robotics world, the, something I discussed is, in a way, very focused, narrowed. I think it's an industrial robot staying on the top of the table and so forth. But the robotics also include all kinds of other applications including mobile robot, okay, the mobile, mobile robot moving on the, the not, not only the factory floor, even the hospital medical applications. So if you broaden to the general robotics, actually robotics and the autonomous driving has got lots of the same problem to share, right? So I think I'm more currently start more interested in doing more on mobile robot. Mobile robot research is now it's becoming fairly simple to do. There are lots of reasonable hardware that I can buy, and to do experiment. I don't it used to be that when the hardware does not exist, I think clever clever student also assembled something. But now some good easy. Hardware is available. So if we gripper, that same kind of thing, the gripper is a very sophisticated gripper is available at reasonable cost. And I think mobile robot is in that sense true. Okay, so I would like to move into that area. But I think if I do mobile robot research, I, I think that I have to buy at least several. Just one is not enough, right? Because I would like to see how do they, they interact. I think actually the human mobile, one mobile robot interaction maybe has a lot of problem. But so I, 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 I think the robot research is very, very exciting field. And uh, what I have done is very small <laughs> part, okay, and I don't, for me, I think it was a lot of fun, but if I do robotics research, 
I certainly would like to see now other topics also. Right? Mm -hmm. Hi, Professor. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I, I personally find that Sim to Real and your work um, on integrating the simulations and you're optimizing your controllers are very fascinating. Um, in your view, what is the most uh, useful aspects of integrating the simulation or the graphical representation of your controller's um, behavior um, in your process? So, actually, that's, that's a very important step. I think the most exciting thing is actually I can see visually often. So graphic interface is very important. I think that to me, I think even textbook, there's a lot of plot used to be when I learned control. Okay, there are lots of step response plot, okay, dumping change and step response pattern change did that way. To me, I think when I was looking at just plot, it was still dry, but if the Computer, even the computer, if the computer can make this plot in my, in front of me, that's very visual. And I think visual things always helps. And on, I think probably it's not your question, but I think the, I mentioned to this to, to several other colleagues, so I just mentioned is, of course, the, we need very back, good background of the mathematics to understand control theory and also very good simulation skills, right? But before simulation, you need to do a lot of good programming skills. Programming skills, including how you can make use of the open software to your research, right? I'm always impressed by young students it's just for them, I think that they, they, are, they grew with uh, the, whatever, the software. Right? They don't need computer manual to, to, to use computer. So they naturally use very all kinds of fancy open software okay, the, and bring solution. Like, like one example is ILQR. I, I, I know the theory of ILQR what kind of loop iteration you have to go through. If I have to write a code to do that, it's a big, big job. I, but for students, it's such a very easy job. They just look for uh, something open software. Say, say, okay, this open software can be used. This part is missing, so I supply this part. And then it's very impressive thing, simulation, right? So I think the... For younger generation, I think probably they don't need to have to worry about programming skills, but I would say programming skill is definitely has to be in our toolbox to be a very efficient, effective control engineer. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Tomisuka. I'm hoping to, to dive into this area of research, and it's all new for me, so it's eye-opening to see all of the, the things you and your team have achieved. So my question now is with the limitation that I've heard, maybe I'm wrong, but about like the limitation in the fabrication of the chips and the rise of quantum computing and all of this, I was wondering what do you think are the challenges to keep on working on like making all of these models faster, let's say. Thank you. Computer, computer chip. Yeah. yeah. So what are some of the limitations that is like, well, you talk about the last five decades, right? Mm -hmm. And now maybe from what I could see is like a lot of things are getting to a plateau, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I was hope, like wondering what do you think are some of the challenges? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that the, the, <clears throat> the real time computation is always important, right? But depending on who, how do you want to apply, presently the people are more and more interested in kind of complicated algorithm for the real-time use. Then how you can really implement in a time-efficient efficient, uh, execution, right? 
uh, it's kind of all the example may not be necessarily good. We, we are doing adaptive control of robot manipulator. And we use direct robot arm, which shows need for adaptive control people talked about. And we implemented using some the processor, I think there's a DSP processor. And I, we could show that the difference between PID control and adaptive control. And we said, oh, finally, okay, this is a proof that adaptive control is really a good approach to the direct drive robot control. Okay, the, then soon after, a little bit more powerful, the processor appeared. And when I, we implemented PID control at much faster cycle, performance was so super, so we couldn't beat PID, right? So it's always kind of race how fast you can do execution. So that, that part is really fascinating. And from now on, I think presently, I, part of the thing, I don't know whether you, I explained detail good enough, but if I tr we try to implement something we learned by the re re reinforcement learning, actually that, so that, that is okay, but I think I, the, yeah, the, the, this is strategy that we learned from ILQR. If we implement that one as is, it's very difficult, so time, time constraint. So we just try to implement in different way. And it was, uh, so, so, so I, I think that that's ki kind of challenge. What is the, com com you, you, it's not more, P more than PID, okay, fairly complicated, big computation. How you can do it efficiently. Okay, so th that may be still an interesting topic. Eventually, it may not be a big issue, okay. Thank you. We'll probably take the one last question from the back. Yeah. Oh, I thank you so much for an inspiring talk. I wanted to ask a question on the future directions of combining the model base and the model free, uh, which is uh, data driven. Because uh, I think I was wondering the goal of the merger is in the direction of learning the physical, the learn about the physics or learning about the existing control technique, which guarantee the stability, which use the physical parameters, right? So the, our technique like Lyapunov or control Lyapunov gave you the guarantee given the simplified model. But do you think the goal should head more towards the learning the physical, let's say how to respect the physics so that we have more complicated model that we can solve it with the model base? Or is it towards to using the technique of the stability guarantee uh, method? Sorry, the question is weird, yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you, you, you have an answer to that question, or...? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, but, uh, but I, I, was, I was wondering, in a way, that which direction we should go to March, in a way, how we keep this model-based uh, nice theory, which is basically, for me, I think it is respecting the physics. And so, uh, should, should we move towards, in terms of more our, let's say, using the model-based control as always the lower end, the like, low-level controller to keep it when we do the, the combinations, or is there other broader yeah. directions? Yeah, yeah I, I, I think it all depends on what kind of problem you would like to solve. The, so if you completely abandon model-based control from any, anything, I don't think it's the right approach. But if you have the feel that I have to always use model-based control. So that, that's not right also. So I think that the right answer probably exists what problem you have got. Okay, so instead of general statement, I, I think it's more, more condition based. Okay, so what, what is your target system? What is the problem you are trying to do? And based on that, the best method is somewhere, combination of both or just going to the one direction. Okay. If you have physics model, 
there is no reason to throw away physics model, right? But that does not necessarily mean that you, you use Lyapunov method always. Model based, the, your mathematical model could be a very important part to simplify your machine learning code, right? Thank you. Okay, for all the audience, uh, if you have further questions, feel free to reach out to Dr. Tomizuka. We will uh, host one our social event here, so we'll be providing live refreshment, and you can chat with others, uh, reach out. And also, I want to thank um, Marsha and uh, Darla for organizing this event, and also the staff from the Hof Music uh, to organize this. But most importantly, thank you for Dr. Tomizuka to accepting our invitation and flying all the way from San Francisco to Purdue to just give this talk to our faculty and students. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you.